Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this Ocean of Opportunities webinar. You are looking at a live shot from the Center of Ocean Ventures and Entrepreneurship in Halifax, Nova Scotia. This is truly a special place to start and grow an ocean tech company. This is our third webinar in the series, and we are so happy with the engagement we've seen from people and the excitement that exists in the ocean sector, and specifically here in Atlantic Canada. Now is truly the right time to start an ocean company in Canada. There is so much opportunity, activity, energy, and support available here. Before we kick off our conversation with our incredible guest speakers, I want to begin with a short presentation on the Ocean Startup Project. So the Ocean Startup Project is an aggressive 24-month project to grow and develop ocean startups here in Atlantic Canada. We've got an unprecedented regional collaboration happening between six pan-Atlantic organizations being Innovacore, Genesis, New Brunswick Innovation Fund, PEI Bio Alliance, Springboard Atlantic, and Creative Destructions Lab, along with the Ocean Supercluster. The purpose of the project is simply to generate more startup companies in Atlantic Canada. So the vision for this project is Atlantic Canada being the best place in the world to launch and grow an ocean company. That's a really bold vision, and we believe there's never been a better time for a bold vision in the ocean sector. We've got $300 million investment in oceans through the Ocean Supercluster. We have ACOA, who is very active in the ocean space supporting entrepreneurs. We have organizations like all of the partners on this project, along with organizations like Propel, Volta, Ignite, Planet Hatch, Startup PEI, Venn, who want to support entrepreneur, entrepreneurs from an idea phase onward. And we have internationally renowned ocean hubs like Cove, the one you're looking at right here, and Holyrood in Newfoundland, which is going to come online and break ground on new space uh, this spring. This project is going to invest close to $7 million in the development of startups. So how are we gonna do this? The plan for the project is to use webinars like this and boot camps to raise awareness about all of the opportunities in Canada and Atlantic Canada for ocean tech companies to start and grow. Then we will launch the Ocean Startup Challenge and the Lab to Market program. From there, we will work with startup teams to support them through various incubation and acceleration programming. Creative Destruction Lab Atlantic will launch its first 100% ocean cohort later this year and is a resource for massively scalable companies who need mentorship and capital. So the Lab to Market program, we have an abundance of universities and community colleges across Atlantic Canada and Canada generally. We are going to help these bright minds take their ideas from the lab to the market. This program will teach graduate students, postdocs, and faculty researchers how to build, test, and develop a business model centered on real world needs. The process de-risks things for a potential startup because it ensures there is market fit for the product and that critical aspects of starting a business have been addressed. Up to 20 teams will be formed and they will receive $15,000 in the initial phase of the program. So here's a company, Bluefin Robotics, that is a lab to market company. And we have the found, one of the co-founders of that company, Jim Bellingham, joining us today. He started Bluefin Robotics in 19, 1997 while working at MIT. Bluefin is a Massachusetts-based company that develops, builds, and operates autonomous underwater vehicles and was acquired by Battelle in 2005. We're going to have an opportunity to ask Jim about this today and hear more about how he did this. The point we are making is there are opportunities like this available in oceans in every post-secondary institution in Canada. We want you to apply to our Lab to Market Oceans program now and start forging your path. We're here to support you. We also have the Ocean Startup Challenge. The Ocean Startup Challenge is going to launch in May 2020. So this is about market pull. We are going to find out the priority items industry needs solved, and we are going to ask you to solve them. 
Throughout this experience, there will be supports in place to help you through that idea phase to submission. We'll be running numerous boot camps and we intend to work closely with all of the top accelerators and incubators in this region like Knight, Volta, Propel, Planet Hatch, Startup Yard, and Venn. So we say there is no better time to take the leap into entrepreneurship than right now. All the supports are in place, there's a growing ocean community, and there's active investment. Answer our challenge or submit your own idea for an ocean company. We want to find and support good ideas. Finally, we just want to provide this slide. This is how we stay in touch. We want you to get in touch. We want you to join our Facebook group. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But here is a way to stay in touch with the Ocean Startup Project as we move through this exciting 24-month project. So folks, I am so excited about today's conversation on emerging trends in ocean business and research with two world-class ocean experts. Our guests are deep thinkers who have such unique and interesting perspectives on the ocean. I will introduce Dr. Jim Bellingham and Dr. May Cito shortly. But over the next few weeks, we will be joined by other great speakers as well, like Jim and May, who will share their stories and insights through inspiring conversations and will highlight the incredible opportunities that are available in the ocean sector. Next week, we will be joined by a few established ocean companies to, to discuss what it takes to be successful in the ocean sector. Be sure to look for the link to register for next week's webinar towards the end of today's talk. A few important notes as we get started. We want to create new connections and collisions through this webinar series, and so we've set up a Facebook group that all webinar participants are welcome to join so we can continue to interact and have those collisions. If you have an idea and need support, a co-founder, skills, or you can mentor or advise a startup, we encourage you to join the group so that you can meet people who you may be able to assist. Search Ocean Startup Project on Facebook to find us or click the link that Rebecca has posted in the chat room. Be sure to introduce yourselves in the chat room and share where you are watching from and what you are working on. Please post your questions as well. We'll be sure to include them during the Q&A portion near the end of the webinar. So without further ado, I am thrilled to be joined by Jim and May today. Dr. May Cito has worked in private industry on research and development projects related to autonomous underwater vehicles. She moved to Nova Scotia to work as a defense scientist for Defense R&D Canada. May is an associate professor at the Dalhousie Department of Mechanical Engineering, where her research interests include the Intelligence Systems Laboratory and computer science to enable autonomous systems to operate at long ranges from an operated, operator for extended durations in harsh and dynamic environments like oceans and space. Dr. Jill Bellingham is the founding director of the Center of Marine Robotics at Wood at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Jim joined Hui from the, Mon the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research in Institute, where he was the first director of engineering and then chief technologist. Prior to Mbari, Jim founded the Autonomous Underwater Vehicles Laboratory at MIT Sea Grant and co-founded Bluefin Robotics. I want, I want you to, I want you to, I want you to know that I spent most of the week paring down these two people's bios. And if I didn't, we would have used the full hour just talking about all the impressive things they have done and accomplished over their careers. So Jim and May, thank you very much. And, and we'll just jump right into the questions. So my first question is, uh, you two are very distinguished people in your respective fields. And I wanna know a little bit about your careers and how you got to this stage. May, I think I'll start with you. So um, I've always been interested in robotics as an exploration tool because it allows some part of our, our expedition to go into an area that's uh, difficult. So under ice, space, tops of mountains, right? So robotics can extend this, this ability to explore, right? So uh, just, very quickly, I I did my, my degrees on the West Coast. I'm from the University of British Columbia, so I'm from engineering. And then I um, 
did a postdoctoral fellowship with an NSERC sponsored postdoctoral fellowship with ISC Limited. So at that point in the world and in, in time, they were number one or two in terms of produ uh, producing vehicles. So I spent five really interesting years with them. And I took all that knowledge that I had with um, operations, design, research with underwater vehicles, and I was a defense scientist at DRDC on the East Coast. So there I worked on acoustic signatures, uh, autonomous vehicles for naval marine applications, uh, tow systems, and whatever else they had got me to work on. And then I took all of that uh, knowledge, experience, and I'm now with the um, Dalhousie University Faculty of Engineering. So I'm my home is in mechanical, but I'm cross-appointed to electrical and to computer as well. And there we look at uh, developing autonomous systems for either scientific, commercial, or military applications. So the specific aspect that we add is the autonomy. So the uh, decision making, the learning, the collaboration, the mission replanning, uh, the skills and putting those onto the robot because then that extends the robot's uh, distance that it can work from from the operator as well as the duration that it's able to work for unattended right and if you can get the robot to have all these so-called ai machine learning and other skills on board you've come closer to capitalizing on the value of deploying a robot so we do that type of research at dell in conjunction with uh, engineering computer science and uh, oceanography. Um, our lab also works with quite a few government labs, so with the uh, DRDC as, as well as um, others. And we've got a fair number of industrial partners that we work with. So throughout my career, I've always maintained our collaborations with our industrial partners, whether they're in Canada, the US or the UK. Right. So that's how I got to this point. I like to solve tough problems using multidisciplinary approaches and I certainly appreciate what our industrial partners can contribute to the problem. They work in a different space and in a different environment. So they have a definite contribution. Terrific. Thanks, May. Jim, over to you. We heard a bit about your bio, but uh, tell, us, tell us how you got to this stage in your career. Let's see. Um... Well, I started out life really in a, in a completely different domain. My first published paper was in astronomy, uh, as uh, as uh, and and I always thought that uh, I wanted to be an astronaut or an astrophysicist. Uh, those don't uh, sound like the same things, but you know, I figured I'd somehow find a way to combine them. Uh, so my PhD is actually in physics, uh, and uh, what what happened to me was as I got out and really started seriously looking at careers, I realized that, that what I wanted was something that was sort of at this intersection of a scientific frontier, uh, a technical frontier, and a physical frontier. And that was really what I was looking for. And as I looked at NASA at the time, uh, the astronaut positions weren't opening up so frequently. Uh, the, uh, uh, what, you, what you really did was you put your time in a lab, which didn't look that interesting to me, and when I looked across at other fields, uh, while well, I had been in, in touch with some folks uh, through, through the Sea Grant program who were trying to get a robotics program going. And uh, as I got out and looked around at the things to do, that started looking really attractive uh, to me. And just at the point at which uh, I had to make a decision, they decided that they were gonna fund, uh, they were gonna uh, corral some money from, for a laboratory. We're looking for someone to run it. And that was, uh, uh, I made the jump. My, my friends all thought I was insane. This was back in the late 80s. And one of the first things I did, May, was I went out to International Submarine Engineering. So Jim McFarland Sr. Yes. Um, uh, I would like to think was, was kind of one of my first mentors uh, in this whole field. Uh, you know, I remember going out there. It was at the midst of a, an oil and gas downturn. Uh, he had a bunch of folks he was keeping on payroll, and I remember him taking me back into the, the shop area and pointing out, he goes, you know, those three folks over there, you can't, you can't distract them because they're working on something for me. But yeah. if you can get the attention of anyone else here, uh, you know, they're welcome to work with you. And so, uh, so we built up this little vehicle we called Sea Squirt, uh, yes. and we got it pulled together in about two months out there. So we, we built up the first, my first autonomous underwater vehicle really quickly. 
Um, I made some really close friends uh, that uh, to this day, uh, you know, we're in close touch with. As a matter of fact, when I started Bluefin, I went back and, uh, and poached a few of them. And, uh, you know, from, from that day forward, you know, I've done a lot of different things in the marine robotics space. Uh, but uh, that was for me, for me, kind of the turning point, if you will, uh, of my career. I, I, uh, I really, you know, what are the things about it I like? Well, I really like working on the technical problems because, uh, because you get to be, uh, you get involved in a lot of different types of science. So as a scientist, you know, you build your career in a particular area and you're probably going to work there for most of the rest of your life. You know, as a technologist, I, I get to work on biological oceanography. I get to work on physical oceanography. I go to the Antarctic. I go to the Ant uh, Arctic. Uh, you know, there's a, mm -hmm. it's kind of have robot will travel. Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, totally. you get a chance to see the world in a way that uh, that, that very few few people do. And and I, I've also worked a lot on uh, defense problems. So uh, so I. You know, those are important to me as well. And, and uh, these underwater robotic systems have uh, large implications in the defense world as well. And so that's also been, uh, you know, a piece of my life. And I think that, that the, I, the, the, the real key lesson for me is that it's all about teams. And, and so the people that you're working with who bring the different uh, skill sets, if you will, to the party uh, that ultimately, uh, you know, gel and all work together to create an enterprise, whether that's a scientific enterprise or an enterprise around a company or around a defense problem. Uh, those are the those are the things that, that I, I've enjoyed doing and that the marine robotics have been kind of uh, uh, a nice focal point for, uh, you know, what to some degree is kind of a social activity, an intellectual and social activity. Well, I, I think the the ocean robotics world is lucky you didn't become an astronaut, Jim. I think uh -huh. that would be my estimation. May, can you just talk to us a little bit? You, you touched on on your career, but why ocean robotics for you? Why did you why did you find that place to land uh, in, in your career? So again, robotics, because it's part of the exploring me, right? There are places we can't go to easily, like ocean and space. And, um, and I'm a frustrated astronaut too, like Jim is. Uh, so, so oceans is the next best thing, right? And the ocean robotics had special appeal because it could also contribute to um, Earth's, you know, the overall health of the planet. And, uh, you know, in the early to mid 90s. Am I still there? We can hear uh, we can hear you. Uh, you have uh, your placeholder picture up. Okay. All right. So should I be concerned about that? Or do you want me to continue? I, I don't know why I've lost. Um... Yeah, I can't hear uh, Don. Uh, so I can see that Don was talking. But Don, I can't can you, hear you. Can you hear me now, Jim? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So ocean robotics, I'm just going to continue anyways, uh, keep, keep things going because of the impact it could have on our economy. So even when I started, so when I was at ISC, Jim, I was, um, and yes, Jim was, Jim McFarlane was my first main mentor in this area. Uh, it wasn't a big, it wasn't a big area yet, right? So ocean robotics, you know, ISC was, I think, first or second in the world at that point. But uh, we could see a lot of potential good economic impact. You're opening up the uh, the world and the economy if we can um, we can exploit and and be curious about what's happening underwater in a much bigger way. Right. So that was one reason for going into it, improving Earth's health and the uh, potential benefits economically. Uh, at the time, so this would have been the the, the late 90s, I guess. Uh, there were a lot less people working in the area. Right. And because of that, there's lots of opportunity, lots of good possible contributions that could be made. Right. And uh, even in our I, in my ISC days, I was interested in the this autonomy, the the ability to make the robots smarter that um, that we could put onto these robots. And there was a lot of potential for that, and lots of good challenges. Um, navigation underwater is difficult. Communications underwater is difficult. 
and generally energy density is a problem if you're um, deploying an autonomous robot to begin with. So in short, the usual reasons, the ability to explore elsewhere and still see the uh, ability to contribute to Earth's overall health as well as the scientific, commercial, and military applications. It's just a good place for tough problems. So that was the appeal for me. That's great. I want to dive right in here. Uh, I want to get right into the meat of this because there's some really interesting issues that you two are both at the forefront on. So I want to talk about AI, artificial intelligence, and, and the fact that global technology are, are driving the rapid evolution and and, and global adoption of autonomy. Can you talk about AI and its growing application on the ocean? Jim, I'll start with you. Sure. Uh, well, I'll say first of all that uh, you know one of the one of my big discoveries early on, and I don't mean a discovery in a profound intellectual sense that it surprised anyone else, but it, it kind of uh, ran counter to what I expected was uh, in the early days uh, when I started working on, on these vehicles, C-Squirt was really intended as a software test bed for, you know, for sort of artificial intelligence approaches towards, a, uh, towards controlling these systems. And you know, those of us on the call and the people listening are probably well aware of the fact that since seawater is a conductor, you know, we aren't in communication, at least via radio uh, methods with our, with our underwater vehicles. Uh, and, uh, you know, even acoustic communications is something which is, is, is uh, uh, you know, only works over short ranges and low bandwidths and large latencies. So the AI, uh, you know, we all thought was going to become was going to be something that was going to be really critical to the success of these vehicles. And what I was a little surprised to realize early on was, in fact, uh, you know, really simple things were useful underwater. And so, from a scientific perspective, uh, you know, I didn't need uh, a lot of AI to make a vehicle which produced scientifically useful data. As a matter of fact, a lot of my really big problems. We're not sort of in um, uh, 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 sort of finding my way through a complex environment. Uh, it, uh, a lot of the complexity revolved around knowing where I was. I mean, I don't have GPS and I'm operating in the deep sea environment. Uh, how do I know where I am without putting in place, you know, all of our, we don't, we have, don't have silver bullets there. We have a lot, we have a toolkit of parts. Uh, and a lot of times what we're doing is for any given application, we're pulling pieces out of the toolkit and then engineering a navigation solution around a particular application. And, uh, you know, more recently, uh, I've really found that there's a lot of application for machine learning and AI mm -hmm. in the fault detection and recovery. Yes. So reliability, I think, uh, again, for somebody who operates vehicles uh, at sea, you care a lot about whether they come back or not with with the data that you wanted them to to get uh and as a consequence that whole reliability uh, that whole reliability aspect of it becomes a really big deal and and one of the things that you realize is when you compare them to other complex systems which are engineered uh we don't get uh the test time that you get for example on an aircraft before it goes into service uh, we don't have the test facilities uh to test and debug systems and work through those problems. Uh, we have to we have to go to sea uh, fairly early in the development cycle, uh, just as the nature of our business, and particularly in the ocean sciences. Right? I mean, uh, it already takes us long enough to get something working in the ocean. You know, tack on another five years to really have it working perfectly. You know, <laughs> that's just not an option. And so, as a consequence, we have to come up with uh, different approaches uh, for for AI fault detection and reliability. Um, which will work on a system which is not as well characterized, uh, you know, which may have, uh, you know, m more problems in it, you know, as a consequence. Uh, and nonetheless, uh, you demand it works in a very harsh environment uh, and produce data sets uh, which may be uh, quite com complex. And so I found that those are the areas where uh, we've had particularly particular success with AI. Now, I will say that some of my colleagues at Woods Hole are doing some really interesting things. Uh, Yogi Girdar works uh, with various unsupervised machine learning algorithms. Uh, I've actually applied those to some of the fault detection and recovery. 
Uh, but Yogi uh, is much more interested in the exploration aspects of it. And, uh, you know, increasingly those create a whole set of very interesting challenges when you start asking how you apply those to systems of robots that are, for example, developing their own different representations of the environment as they learn about it. And yet, at the same time, you're expecting them to coordinate. So uh, it's a very rich domain. Uh, there's an awful lot of interesting problems. And I think particularly as you go to these multi-platform systems uh, and a lot of application to things that are uh, broadly applicable, not just to marine robotics. So this, uh, you know, anomaly detection, uh, mm -hmm. fault diagnosis and recovery uh, for, uh, you know, for, for early stage systems is something which, uh, which is necessary in a lot of different places. As a matter of fact, I've learned a lot of lessons from looking at how SpaceX uh, approaches their complex engineering problems. So, so these are, uh, uh, it's a very interesting time to be working in it, right? Because, because, you know, and of course, the other thing, which I think we all know on, on this call, and I'm sure our, 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 uh, the, the folks who are joining us uh, are, are aware, there's an enormous amount going on there driven by large, uh, large emerging markets in other fields, uh, which are applicable to the undersea space. So a lot of opportunities. So, uh, May, I'm, I want to ask you a question that dovetails off of some of the stuff that Jim talked about, and it's, it's with respect to machine learning. So can you talk about the opportunities with machine learning and what you're doing from a machine learning perspective with some of, of the autonomy that you're working on? So the machine learning applications that are uh, quite useful for us uh, so an example of a project is to be able to recognize targets that are picked up with uh, sensors underwater. So you could be looking for starfish, hydrothermal vents, uh, mines, or, or other targets. So the ability to do that, and you can do that using sometimes more classical uh, approaches, right? So getting using lots of labeled data and then using supervised or unsupervised learning to, to try and recognize these things. Uh, so as in terms of an opportunity, something that I really would have liked is a, is a smaller company that can help help us uh, take the vast stores of data that we've got for whether it's starfish mines or hydrothermal vents and to be able to label them. Mm. Right. So I looked far and wide and there were a few companies only in California. And the one that I did show a lot of interest in wasn't replying. So if there were machine learning companies out there that had uh, the ability to label large data sets for us, I think that would be quite useful. And I would have been willing to pay through the teeth for that because um, that's something that's quite uh, labor intensive and is not necessarily the objective of what I'm trying to do. So what I'm trying to do is to put a, a machine learning model onto a, uh, an embedded platform and have it apply that. Right. Another technique that we've uh, found useful, and this is something that Jeffrey Hinton, who's one of the the giants in machine learning in Canada came up with is the ability to, to do distillation, right? So you would take these large machine learning models and distill it to, to some threshold so that it can live on an embedded platform and uh, be able to, to operate that way. So it's great and all to have a, a big machine learning model that can pick out whatever it is you're looking for, you know, one particular type of dog. But if I can, use that type of classification and have that on board the robot so that I can do this in situ, uh, that would be very useful, right? So uh, Jeff Hinton's models have been very useful for us with that. So, and I think the greater use for what I would like to do with um, autonomous vehicles is to have the models deployed on embedded platforms. Right, uh, towards that, I think there are lots of opportunities in machine learning to look at learning in non-stationary environments. So environments that change and fluctuate spatially and temporally like the ocean does. Right, so if there are people that are interested in that. Uh, we are happy to talk to them if they can help us. Uh, so that's... Um, hey, I, am, am I hearing you say that there's, there is an opportunity in that space for uh, a company, somebody to solve a problem is... is Potentially, yeah. Potentially, yeah. Right? Yeah. So the ability to take large models, distill it down to something that can work on an embedded platform. Uh, that, that should be 
almost a skill that I could get by turning the crank. Right. And if you if you've done it many times, you're you're very good at it, and then you could be of service to others as well. Right. So this Jim, do you have anything you want to add there? Oh, excuse me, man. Sorry. Do you want well, to no, add anything she, there? Uh, she's raised a, a number of great topics. Uh, you know, I guess sort of mapping them into how I think about things. Uh, you know, uh, what I heard you talking about early on was the need for annotated data sets in yes. the understanding environment. And uh, yeah, this is, I think this is something that really, uh, where frankly, we're way behind a lot of the other fields that are applying or working on machine learning. Uh, if you, and, and in fact, the existence of these annotated uh, data sets uh, is really instrumental in the rate of progress in other fields. Uh, you know, I think they provide, uh, first, they're very hard to create. Um, very few of us in the undersea environment even have that data to begin with. Um, so if, if those are made available, those become an enormous service, I think, uh, to the, the larger community. And they also provide sort of a, you know, a friendly competition ground, if you will, right? If everyone is running against the same, uh, the same data sets, you know, as they have these standard data sets, again, you know, in the autonomous car space, uh, you know, for machine learning, uh, those, those become, uh, those become uh, a place where you can compare uh, different approaches uh, and different algorithms. So I think I think I think we really I, I think May is right. We really need that. Um, it is tough in the undersea environment because we uh, we don't have that annotation. And I'll say by the way that in the past, I've worked with some on some teams that have had some success using uh, using approaches like uh, Amazon Turk. So if mm -hmm. you're familiar with that, you say Amazon Turk is. Uh, is a platform created by Amazon quite a while ago, actually. I haven't used it for, for, for a while, um, but it's where you can put up data sets. Uh, you put a couple of training data sets and you teach people how you want things annotated and then you have them annotate them. Uh, and, you know, in the past, uh, uh, it was used for, it's been used for all kinds of things. I mean, if you, if you Google it and you go, you go take a look at it, you'll see, you know, I don't know, um, legal documents from the 1800s, which were in cursive that, you know, people will uh, will sort of sign in, become an annotator uh, and get paid a few, you know, I don't know, a little bit of page, right, to annotate the page. But you, we used it in a, a project where uh, a, a colleague, uh, Jim Gray, uh, disappeared at sea. And, uh, and we had, in this large search occurred, and one of the things that we did were we were able to get some pretty good remote sensing data uh, and uh, the problem was there was so much of it. How did you go to it? And and uh, one of a, one of the members of the team was at Amazon at the time and used Amazon Turk as the platform. And in a day, literally, we had gone through the entire data set. Something that we thought you know was going to potentially take us take us weeks. So uh, so very powerful, uh, very powerful uh, platform. So I think that producing some of these annotated data sets is probably um, you know as, as as May pointed out. Uh, uh, critical to our field and something that will raise sort of all boats, you know, if we can get those out there and get those done. And it would hold what we're thinking about doing. Uh, there's a fellow, a colleague of mine, Carl Kaiser, who's working on uh, sort of a digital test framework. Uh, and, uh, you know, the idea is, is leverage off of as much out there as already exists. Uh, you know, so we leverage Ross, we leverage Moose. Uh, but one of the things we'd like to do is tie sort of a physical infrastructure to a digital infrastructure so that you're kind of smoothly moving from one to the other. Because as I kind of alluded to in the early stages, you know, uh, getting to the prototype is expensive but manageable. Getting from the prototype to an operational system at the sea in the ocean world is incredibly expensive because we have to do it on ships and we have to instrument it every time. And we're subject to weather while we do it. And it's just a very, you know, the ocean is a very tough place to debug things. So, I, you know, for us, I think a large part of how we accelerate this field uh, revolves around creating the appropriate facilities uh, and tools on shore that let you accelerate things that you used to have to go to sea to test, uh, let, lets you do them on shore or lets you do them virtually. So, so I think those, to me, are 
uh, you know, very high priorities. And, and those are things that we've been making large investments in here at Woods, uh, at Woods Hole, uh, not just for ourselves, but for, for the broader community. Yeah, I agree with Jim on that. I mean, test beds are very important, uh, especially hardware in the loop test beds. I mean, we have some of Huey's test beds, uh, in particular, their acoustic modem test beds. This way, we don't have to go to C, deploy. Uh, you know, going to C is anywhere from $20,000 a day to anywhere higher than that, right? Because you're paying for the ship, for the food, for the crew. If we can test things in the lab ahead of time, uh, that really reduces the value of developing things for the ocean environment. Right? So the development of hardened the loop test beds for most instruments that I use would be very useful. Yeah, one of the other challenges I seem to hear about a lot with respect to autonomy and subsurface autonomous vessels are the communication challenges. Can you two talk to us a little bit about the communication challenges how that impacts what you're doing from autonomy and machine learning standpoint. And may, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about swarming and, and the impact that has on, on some of that work, because I know you're particularly interested in, in, in the, the notion of swarming and having some smaller vehicles working in tandem together. Do you want Jim to start or do you want, I, want me to start? Go ahead, May, please, go ahead. Okay. Well, if so communications is difficult under sea. Um, we've got range dependent bandwidth limited uh, challenges as well as very high ambience, multipath. So all the usual reasons. And what that means is any communications you normally have under sea is quite terse, right? So that may or may not be to your advantage for the task that you want to do. So swarming, as you call it, we, we usually call that a collaboration. So at one of our, our uh, trials, that I was privileged to be a part of. We had uh, seven or eight UUVs that were collaborating on a mine countermeasure scenario, and they would be um, communicating with two surface uh, robots. So the surface robots can speak underwater and they can relay above water. And both surface robots would communicate their findings to an aerial vehicle. So there, in total, there was 11 robots in this collaboration. And at the end of the day, they were able to uh, transmit what the underwater robots, so all seven or eight of them underwater, that were able to find. So take their findings and send it over the horizon to another point where decision makers, say naval decision makers, can decide what the next step should be. So when I started my career, that would have been an earth-shaking um, contribution. and. And in 2016, 2017, that was still a very uh, state-of-the-art uh, capability to have. So given the difficult conditions with communicating underwater, you're quite challenged to, to send your messages amongst at least the underwater vehicles in, in a very terse, coded way. Right? So, and uh, that will have an impact on the machine learning, because one thing you could do is uh, take images of what we had taken underwater from from using acoustic sensors and transmitting that information so that definitely has an impact right and the ranges we were going on over made it all the more difficult so this is the uh, ranges underwater so that that has an impact on what you can do so you you learn to use other tools like inference so with inference you normally know what the other vehicles were supposed to do and if you can only check in intermittently or or with great latencies, you can still uh, do your job, right? So the the small straw that you can get information through underwater definitely is a hindrance. So we try to make our communications terse. We use inference and uh, any other means to try and get the mission done, right? So there's you're pushing up against the immutable physics of underwater acoustic propagations, right? Um, so your, your machine learning and uh, AI, if you like, tools are, are doing their job on board the vehicle. So you're not, you're not transmitting data, you're transmitting information because that's at a much lower bandwidth. So that's how we've been able to cope and get quite a few vehicles underwater to uh, 
communicate with one another towards a common goal. Yeah. So, any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah. So, I think uh, you know that there's sort of two two threat. There's uh, this is such a rich topic area. Um, I'll just mention that uh, that uh, we've already mentioned Lee Freitag, who uh, who works uh, who works on acoustic communications here. Uh, Norm Farr, another one of my colleagues at Woods Hole, uh, develops optical comms, which which I never really thought about as a viable option uh, until I really saw this in action. And just like navigation, where we don't have silver bullets, but we do have a pretty good toolkit, uh, each of these provides you know useful communications capabilities that you know for a particular application you can architect around. So acoustic comms, uh, you know, is high latency. Uh, it's lower bandwidth. It's challenged in environments where you have a lot of multipath, like long, shallow channels. Uh, it's uh, it's it's not as challenged, right, in a vertical channel in the deep ocean. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you can you can use it for pushing data over longer distances. Uh, optical comms works over shorter ranges. You know, sort of think a megabit uh, per second over a range of maybe 100 meters in the deep ocean. And uh, while that's a short range by the standards of the perhaps the oceanographic processes we might be interested in, uh, it is uh, it is a very useful range uh, when I have two systems that need to interact with each other that needs to need to uh, uh, send a lot of information. So, for example, uh, one use of optical comms uh, was really promoted by oil and gas. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, their comment was, is, you know, why am I running a tether all the way down to the seafloor to an ROV um, to work on all this infrastructure near the seafloor when my infrastructure already has power and comms? If you add an optical comms uh, modem, you know, in effect to your piece of infrastructure, then your untethered vehicle can fly up to it. And when it gets close enough, um, uh, it, it uh, can establish that optical link and in effect function as a optically linked, untethered, uh, uh, remotely operated vehicle and work around the infrastructure under human control. Uh, something that, of course, oil and gas uh, is very concerned about is, uh, you know, a fully autonomous robot operating near their uh, very yeah, yes. uh, uh, high value uh, infrastructure, uh, high value infrastructure on the seafloor. So that's an example, right, of the kind of capability. And we, we you know, Norm show, has a great video of him and Alvin where they put a seafloor, uh, Alvin being, of course, our deep diving submersible. Uh, where they put a camera on the bottom and the camera is feeding the imagery back to the Alvin sphere. And uh, so you're getting sort of a picture of yourself. You're getting kind of a God's eye view of your vehicle, which is something you never get when you're in the ocean in the vehicle uh, on on your own. Um, now, my experience with with multi platform systems really came from uh, trying to observe distributed ocean process, uh, processes uh, more or less synoptically. Uh, and, and that was for us, you know, where a lot of our early work with the gliders, these uh, buoyancy driven vehicles came from. Uh, they're great in the sense that they are lower cost, uh, they're hot, longer endurance, but they are slow. And so uh, it turns out that you don't use them adaptively in, you know, you see something interesting and they all rush to a location because there's no such thing as rushing when you're only moving 25 or 30 centimeters a second. <laughs> um, but on the other That's hand, if you're observing a uh, ocean process, um, you really do care about maintaining your array. And what one of the problems, a really good example of, of uh, what sounds like a trivial problem but tough one to solve was that if you have a current in the environment it tends to blow all the vehicles to one side of your observation area yeah and uh and so if they're all running race tracks they all end up bush, bunched up at the downwind or the down current side of the racetrack uh and so what you really want is you want the vehicles to kind of know what environment the other vehicles in so this is sort of a common operational picture problem which really, I think, uh, encompasses a lot of the great points that May was making. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not I, what I, the information I want is that common picture. I want to understand what the environment, the other vehicle, if I'm vehicle A, um, I don't want I, I want to know that I shouldn't be rushing to the other end of the racetrack because the other vehicle is stuck down there. So it's actually maybe better for me to loiter up where I am. 
And, and that's the kind of uh, common operational picture and communication that you want, for example, to maintain uh, things for that particular application. So, so communications is for us, um, again, you know, it, it's, uh, it, 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 it is uh, something which uh, lets you enormously extend the operational uh, uh, capabilities of a platform and the endurance of the platform uh, but you have to manage it. And I, I guess one last example is we built this very long duration vehicle while I was out at Ambari. It's uh, been a big success. Uh, it's not commercialized yet. Um, although if folks are interested in commercializing it, they should contact Ambari. So this is a Tethys vehicle. And, uh, um, you know, we run it for, in, for operations up to sort of, a, you know, a month or so at a time. Uh, I think there's 10 of them now in existence. They carry very sophisticated payloads. And, uh, you know, early on, I was very concerned uh, how, how, you know, rewriting code that's going to work flawlessly without a single bug for four weeks doing very sophisticated ocean sampling. That doesn't seem too likely. So what we did was we instituted a, uh, a check in uh, via a software link or via a satellite link. So the vehicle can come to the surface and talk to you at home when it sees something sort of anomalous. And what, what that lets you do is dial your thresholds for detecting faults way down. Uh, so I'm not going to, uh, I don't care if occasionally I ask for help and I don't really need it. Um, as long as I don't let that fault through, which m might mean my vehicle doesn't come home. And so the communication link there greatly extends your ability to take on more complex missions and operate longer at sea, uh, even though you only use it comparatively uh, infrequently. So, so a couple of, couple of examples from my, uh, my experience with this. That's great. <clears throat> um, I think we could dive into the communications piece and, and the machine learning uh, for about three more hours. Uh, yeah. There's there's so much there's so much meat there. But one thing, what we're trying to do with this project is create some more startups here in in Atlantic Canada in this in this ocean sector. And so, can you guys talk a little bit about what are the market drivers and who are the big users of of marine robots right now and and where do you think there's opportunities in the future for growth? I think about offshore wind and commissioning and decommissioning of oil and gas. Defense obviously comes to mind, energy, fiber optic cable. But could you talk to just your thoughts around that and, and where there are opportunities in the future? I'll start with Jim on that one. Sure. So. Uh... You know, the largest market right now for the autonomous underwater vehicles oh, okay. is really the defense market. So, you know, I would guess that 80 percent or something like that or more of the sales are are oriented towards defense or defense related research. Um, you know, and then there's a reasonable uh, commercial and growing commercial market out there. Uh, I have, uh, you know, it's probably taken a big hit because of this, this large oil and gas downturn. All of the oil and gas companies that I talk to and the oil and gas service companies are all in the process of reorganizing. Um, I will say, on the other hand, that a lot of the technical advances historically have occurred during these downturns. So if you're an investor, now's the time to jump in, right? Because, uh, you know, this is sort of the window, if you will, for inserting innovation. Uh, big lessons for that out of, you know, the 2014-2015 period is, as well, which uh, we can come back to. But, uh, but yeah, I think there's, in, in general, what you alluded to there with uh, offshore wind, there's a uh, offshore infrastructure market, which, which includes, uh, you know, the pre-site mapping. It includes the installation. It includes inspection. It includes maintenance. It includes decommissioning. Uh, and you know, as a lot of these offshore uh, infrastructures uh, begin to approach sort of the end of their design life. There's real questions about about how you inspect them and going out there with a, a surface platform, which might be equipped with two ROVs to do that inspection, you know, might mean that you're only willing to do that, you know, once a year, maybe. I don't know. I'm, you know, it depends on the infrastructure, of course, but not that frequently. Uh, and yet, at the same time, as you get closer to end of life, you really want to inspect it more often. Or if you're doing something brand new, you're sticking in a wind farm in an area which might have, for example, fishing habitat uh, sensitivities, maybe then you want to do more inspection as well. 
So I, I think there's a, some really interesting markets there in, in uh, uh, related to infrastructure inspection in the offshore, in the offshore environment. Uh, I, I work a lot. Uh, I'm on the board of actually a company in Novasi, which works in the aquaculture domain. And uh, as you probably know, a, a good chunk of a Novasi is up in Halifax, uh, and a great, uh, great organization. Uh, you know, Mark Jolly, uh, the, the you know the president uh, uh, up there, CEO overall of uh, Novasi is David Kelly, uh, a Boston-based company. So a great example there of a Canadian, uh, you know, U.S. Uh, uh, spanning organization, and they're doing a lot of work uh, to look at how you bring technology to bear on aquaculture so that you can push aquaculture into the offshore environment. And I, for me, this is an extremely interesting market. Um, number one, feeding the world is clearly uh, something that we should all care about, right? Uh, and, uh, and, you know, offshore aquaculture really, in principle, has, has a way to be sort of one of the least environmentally impactful, one of the most sustainable ways of generating uh, protein to feed the emerging world who are going to demand more of that as their income increases. And we want their income to increase because uh, we don't want there to be wars, right? Um, and so I think that, uh, and we don't, you know, there's a lot of reasons we, we, we want this to be, uh, the world to be uh, well-fed and sustainably well-fed. Uh, you know, at the same token, you know, this is a little bit like terrestrial agriculture in the sense that it's a very big market, but its margins aren't necessarily always so large. So you're, so, so you have the potential for creating a very different type of marine instrumentation market, one where the cost of the individual devices are low, but the market sizes are really large, enabling you to make a lot of money, um, but produce things which, you know, right now in the oceanographic world, you know, a lot of our measurements, you know, cost us, uh, oh, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars for an instrument which you know, in a normal world, if it was produced in volume, it would probably be a you know a hundred dollar instrument, maybe. And so I think that those are those are things where we might see enormous benefits to the rest of us, particularly in the ocean sciences world, in terms of lower cost instrumentation, which are more scalable, which give us a more pervasive presence in the ocean. And I kind of see aquaculture as potentially kind of a wedge that might uh, that might uh, you know crack that open for, for the rest of us. So a lot of great opportunities out there. Uh, Don uh, didn't hear you there. Yeah, what, what did you say? Oh, sorry, May I, was, May, I was turning it over to you. Oh, okay. So I, I completely agree with Jim. Uh, the military does command the, the lion's share of the market at this point. So they're all compelled with a, a game of keeping up with each other, which I guess drives, uh, drives sales as well. And to be fair to everybody else, the military has the funding for the infrastructure, for the development, for the specialized technicians you have to maintain on staff, right? So in the beginning, uh, when, when, when Jim and I started uh, with underwater vehicles, uh, the TR, TRL was not high, but the cost was. So that tends to attract a, a certain demographic that would be interested in uh, playing in that space. So it's definitely military followed by commercial. So the, the commercial world, and we, we have quite a bit of work with them as well, uh, they're usually in areas, uh, oil and gas is another very big area that's quite interested in uh, underwater vehicles and their use, their intelligent use, so not just sending them out for inspections, but for, um, for, for being able to, to determine perhaps, you know, with a sub-bottom profiler, what is under the seabed that I might be interested in there's no other word, explo exploiting, right? If you're looking for oil or if you're looking for diamonds or for minerals. So that's a, a very large area. And there are a few bigger players that are in there. Uh, manifestations of that using marine robots to tow geophysical streamers uh, is, is a very good ap application. They're a lot cheaper than every single ship that you're going to employ in that process. Uh, so exploitation of wind energy was also something that uh, we've been asked to potentially look at. Right? And uh, that could benefit from applying some marine robot uh, effort. Another area that I think that we should think a little harder about is how we could clean up the, um, the garbage in the ocean using marine robots. I don't know if there's a viable way to do this. And uh, 
Everybody's heard about the challenges with navigation and communications and occasionally endurance with employing underwater vehicles. But uh, if it's a mundane task in an adverse environment, it invites a robot to consider it. Mm. So if anybody can come up with ways of picking up garbage, like, like the plastic bags in the ocean, that, that would uh, benefit everybody in the end. Um, for other opportunities, if, if you were a small company and you, you owned a couple of AUVs, salvage and recovery is, uh, is another big area that could benefit. So everything from people whose ships have sunk to planes that have, have been dropped in the water to other things that need to be found. So at ISC, we've been tasked to, to look for things like that in the past. And it was a difficult task because the advances in communications and navigation were not there. But this is now 15 years later. I think there's a lot more that could be done and with uh, much greater efficacy. So those are potential opportunities beyond uh, what's driven by the military. And, and what's driven by the military is all good. Normally, you know, the military has the, um, the chops to deal with these things in terms of money, infrastructure, sustained staff, and then after the military's developed some technology, then the robustness increases because it's grabbed by another market and the prices drop. So when the robustness increases to TRL 7, 8, or 9, and it works like a turnkey system out of the box, then more markets will become interested, especially when the prices drop. So we went through that transformation maybe five to 10 years ago when, when I noticed that the prices in, the, in these robots dropped dramatically. I, we're running out of time here, you two. We could, we could absolutely talk all day, uh, I'm sure. Um, one thing I, I would love to just get a little bit of advice from you two on startups. And, and what advice would you give to them? You both, Jim, you've started Bluefin Robotics. You've sold Bluefin Robotics. You work with startups regularly. May, you work with startups as well. What advice do you have for a startup in an ocean venture at this time uh, right now? Jim, over to you. Well, I, I think number one is, uh, uh, you know, build a team, uh, build a team. Uh, and if you're in the academic world, uh, you know, value, uh, value those individuals who bring sort of that understanding of the industry and the commercial world and the way to run a company. It's different from running an academic lab. Uh, let me tell you, uh, Frank Van Mirlo, who was uh, the co-founder of Bluefin and really was the guy who was the uh, business guy who turned that into a real company. Uh, you know, without, without, I think without either of us, it, it wouldn't have existed, right? It needed somebody who brought, brought in that, uh, you know, that, that long uh, investment, if you will, on the research side um, but uh, that alone, you know, didn't turn didn't turn it into a company, uh, and uh, you know, it really required somebody who had sort of that entrepreneurial sort of bent and chops to it to really to really turn it into into a going venture. So I think that team, and you know, most of my lab, actually, I think just about all of my MIT lab, including my admin, right, ended up in Bluefin. So there's a point at which there's kind of this, you know, you know, the kind of people you're recruiting want to go start a company. Uh, you know, I had one of my grad students who I desperately was trying to get to finish his PhD. He was so close, but he saw this, uh, you know, he saw this, uh, this, you know, this airplane lifting off and he wanted to be, a, you know, he had, he wanted to be in one of the first seats. Uh, and so you do get sort of that sense of excitement, right, as, as it's going. And I, I think, you know, bringing a, bringing a team on board uh, is key. And I'll say that there's a bunch of folks out there on the academic side today who are people to keep your eyes on. You know, Woods Hole, uh, Aaron Fischel is one of our, mm -hmm. our newer investigators working in, uh, you know, the multi-robot space. She has a lot of interesting ideas about scalability of systems. Um, Amy Kukulia, who probably most people know through Shark Cam, uh, has been working working uh, very hard on application of ro robots to extended presence in the Arctic, uh, initial application being oil spills. Uh, you know, people like that uh, are people to team with if you're on the, uh, if you're on the uh, 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 industry side. 
Uh, and I'm sure I know that up in, uh, you know, in Canada, you have a whole range of organizations doing phenomenal work with researchers. And similarly, uh, you know, the, the, you know, finding those people in the uh, commercial world who have the passion for the ocean, who can take the long view, who are excited about uh, not, you know, coming into an established industry and doing something incremental, but really participating in creating something entirely new, uh, which is tough and it's hard, right? Uh, because uh, there's a whole set of challenges that that, uh, that you have to overcome. You know, th those people are the kind of people, oh dear, we, uh, we've lost, uh, we've lost May. Um, hopefully she'll rejoin us. So, uh, uh, those are the kinds of people that you're looking to team with. And, and maybe while May's back on, I should cut my, my comments uh, short so she can uh, comment. I just, uh, Don, I'm Jim, I'll just jump in there quickly on, on your comments. Uh, what we've heard throughout this webinar series is team, team, team when you're forming a company. And, and you mentioning that again with your experience with Bluefin and, and your experience working with with startups is is so helpful. Also, I love the fact that you know you're encouraging people to look at taking things from the lab to market, and that support network and and pairing people up with industry is exactly what we're trying to do with this project. So we uh, we are very keen to try and help those researchers form that team. So um, May, we've got about one minute. I think I'm over time anyway. But do do you have a few comments on startups and and what you would recommend? Oh dear, uh, May, are you muted? Okay, am I better now? Oh, there you go. There okay. you go. You're back. So, thank you. Finding complementary capabilities on your team. So I, I fully agree with uh, Jim. Nobody does this well in isolation. So find complementary capabilities. Uh, find people who are interested in your problems and have something to bring to the table. I find often the uh, the business end is where all the academics are not very good at. So if you can find business expertise to work with you and people who are good in finance, that would complement your capabilities well. Right. So you're right. Jim's very right. Finding the right team members is, is also quite critical. Okay, you two. I, I just can't thank you enough for taking the time today. This has been a really great conversation. I wish I had two days to do this with you because I think uh, the amount of learning I would have would be just incredible. So uh, I want to just thank everybody out there for joining us today. And again, a special thanks to Jim and May for sharing their time with us. Every week I, I become more and more excited about the opportunities in the ocean sector when I listen to these, these speakers like Jim and May. I want to say a quick thank you to Atlantic Livestream for their in-kind support. Atlantic Livestream is so professional and accommodating. If you can use them, I encourage you to do so. As always, a, a big thank you to Natasha and Rebecca who work in this project and, and just do incredible work to make all of this happen. Uh, before we sign off, I want to mention a great Ocean Connector event that Cove, this, or this institution here, is hosting today at 3 p.m. Atlantic time. Uh, Rebecca will post a link in the chat room if you need more ocean content. That is a great place to get it, and uh, they always put on a great connector event. So please, uh, from the project perspective, please sign up for our next webinar on April 23rd, which will take place at the same time as today's webinar. We have an incredible uh, Canadian ocean tech success stories at at various stages along the way. And, and they're gonna talk about their, the massive opportunities that exist in the ocean sector here in Canada and Atlantic Canada. If you can't make the next webinar, but wanna stay connected, please join our Facebook group, check out our webpage or follow us on social media to stay up to date on the latest developments with the Ocean Startup Project. And be sure to stay tuned for information about our Startup Challenge and our Lab to Market program. The Ocean Startup Challenge is launching in May. So thanks everyone, we, we really appreciate you taking the, the time to join us. The ocean sector is growing and we wanna help you take advantage of those opportunities. So stay in touch and take care of yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Don. Thanks Jim. Yeah, it was a pleasure.
Yeah, next fun. time a beer. Yes, you got to come to Halifax for that, Jim. <laughs> I will do that. <laughs> Look forward to it. Thank you, folks.